Okay, there we go. Now we're recording. So, uh, let's talk about hidden Markov models. Let me uh, bring this up full screen. Okay, now I'm not going to, uh, one, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert uh, in this. Uh, I've seen some recent work done uh, coming out of... Uh, uh, the Monolix group and uh, and Max Carlson's group on using hidden Markov models, and I've largely sort of uh, replicated uh, what some of the work that they've done, uh, but in this case in a Bayesian context. So that's what we're working with here. I haven't actually used this in any uh, in actual production work to date. <coughs> so uh, so bear with me on that. Uh, so I'm, to some degree, learning right along with you on this one. So let's talk about them. Well, first of all, hidden Markov models are models in which the observable data depends on some underlying Markov process. And recall, when we start talking about Markov process or Markov chains, we're talking about, in this case, a sequence of states where the current, the, the the um, the probability of entering the the next state or entering uh, a particular next state depends only on the current state and not on any of the previous history. So once you know the current state of a situation, you basically know everything you need to know uh, to talk about the probabilities associated with which which state you'll enter next. <clears throat> and that's sort of the underlying Markov property that we're working with here. Uh, so in our in the model system we're going to talk about the you can have multiple possible states, but you can only be in one of those states at any given time. Uh, also, we're going to restrict ourselves in this case to discrete time Markov processes. Uh, it is also possible to construct continuous time Markov processes, but we'll, we'll stick with the discrete time case as our, as our starting point. Uh, and in a discrete time Markov process, the time scale is a sequence of discrete times. Uh, more often than not, they're equally spaced, though they don't necessarily need to be. Um, the system can transition randomly from one state to another at each one of those times, uh, and the probability of each transition depends only on the current state, not on any prior state. That's what I was talking about before, and thus the sequence of states is a Markov chain. Uh, so, for any, so if you're in a particular state, so let's say you are in state. We'll just number them, you know, we'll number the states from 1 to n, and let's say you happen to be in state 2 at the current time. Well, if we want to describe, say, the probability that the next state, that at this next time that you're going to enter state 1, then we would call the, then there would be a probability associated with that. So you could talk in terms of the probability that you will enter state 1 given that you are currently in state 2. So we're basically talking about a model that, that has a whole bunch of these conditional probabilities here associated with the probability of going from one state to another. Uh, and that when you write out all these different possible probabilities, what you end up is something that is logically presented in terms of a matrix like you see here. So I've just called the overall matrix P, and then you have this <coughs> whole sequence of probabilities in here where, for example, P11 is the probability that you will enter state 1, well, probability that you will stay in state 1, you know, given that you're already there. P12 is the probability that you uh, you will enter state 1 if you're currently in state 2. You know, uh, P2 is the reverse. You know, it's the probability that you'll enter state 1 given that you're currently in state 2, and so on. So there's all this whole set of probabilities. You can see the diagonal is always the, the probability that you'll stay in the, whatever the current state is uh, that you're in. Okay, so we've so these are going to be a key part of the parameters that we're going to be working with in such a model. Uh, now, there's certain things that 
you don't have quite this many parameters because certain things will will sum to one. Uh, and I always have to think about this for a second. So let's see the probability that you will go from one to I got to remember which one, which direction the the sum goes here. So, um, yeah, I guess if you sum the vertical, if you sum the columns, I believe each column will sum to one uh, in this example for uh, in this case. Okay, so that's just loosely the the basic nature. Uh, of the kinds of model that we're going to work with. So we're going to have some model that somewhere in that model there's going to be this Markov process in here describing transitions from one discrete state to another discrete state. And in our case that will occur also at a discrete set of times. Uh, so possible applications and this is something I haven't uh, spent a lot of time on either but uh, but I can certainly think of some cases, uh, and in this case I just mentioned that uh, it might describe certain types of autocorrelation uh, that you might encounter. Uh, one I mentioned would be uh, where you've got binary or binomial data in which the probability of an event changes at random from one constant value to another. So you might, for example, see a set of data where you know, where, say, within an individual, let's say you've got within an individual, you're going to uh, you're going to observe whether or not an event occurs. And let's say we'll do it on a daily basis. So each day you're going to go in and observe a patient and see whether or not a particular event occurs within that day. Uh, what you might find is that it might not appear as a simple set of you know independent random events you may find that gee it looks like you've got a patient that goes on for days with no event and then all of a sudden he goes through a whole run of days where he where he has a high frequency uh, of events uh, and then maybe goes back again to a long period where he has no events well if you're describe trying to describe that in terms of a simple binary with a fixed probability over the entire time period you wouldn't tend to see those kinds of runs over time well perhaps that could be described by something like this a a markov model where <clears throat> you go through periods where the probability of an event is quite low and then for, you'll go through a period of time where the probability of events are quite high uh, another case here, which is uh, consistent with the example we're going to look at, is you might run into a situation where you've got count data where the event hazard changes at random from one constant value to another. Again, this would be an example where you might see uh, maybe long periods of time where there are relatively low count levels, and then all of a sudden you'll hit a, a sequence of time where maybe the count levels are quite high. Uh, and then perhaps they'll transition back, but again, not you know. But these occur to some degree ran at random, or at least they're not explainable in terms of other information. So you do not have the information to describe those changes in terms of some deterministic model. So something like a uh, a the hidden Markov model might be the way of describing what's happening. Now, notice in both of these cases the the uh, observed data itself is not described as a markov chain it's some underlying parameter in the model that is described in terms of a markov chain in the first case it's the probability of an event uh which which takes on the nature of a a markov chain uh, uh values and in the count data it's the hazard or if you prefer you can think of it as the the average count rate uh, which is described in terms of a Markov process. Well, of course, you don't directly observe the probability in the first case or the hazard in the second case. You observe counts and you observe whether or not an event occurs. So the actual quantity which is described by the Markov process is a latent variable or a hidden variable, and thus the name a hidden Markov model. So that's the category of model we're going to look at. Uh, 
we'll take a little bit of time looking at a particular example that's uh, uh, that's been presented uh, on a number of occasions in uh, the PKPD literature. Um, and, and that's the one we'll work with here. These are just two presentations of essentially the same um, same material with a little bit different emphasis in the two um, the two presentations. You can see the author list is the same. So we've got whatever. I've never been sure of the pronunciation there. I'll go for M. Delatra. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got yeah, our Savick, oh, Raymond Miller there, Mats Carlson, and Mark Laviel. Uh, it's the same author list. In fact, I think it's the same title. Yeah. Estimation of Mixed Hidden Markov Models uh, with SAEM, uh, Application to Daily Seizures Data. Uh, this was actually a set of data that um, I believe came out of the Pfizer program, and thus Raymond Miller's name uh, in here, because uh, his main function in here, I guess, is he supplied the data uh, for the work that you see here. Uh, and you can see it was presented in this case the ACCP meeting and also at the at the subsequent page meeting uh, with again slightly different uh, emphases in the two presentations. Uh, what I'm like to do is actually I'm going to go ahead and use uh, the slides from the page meeting here or a subset of those uh, just to to show the example here uh, since I guess those are fair games since they've appeared on the the page website. So let me go ahead and show you that, and in particular, it'll help us understand sort of what led to the ra their rationale for using such a model. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here's the presentation. Let's see what part we want. Okay, first of all, the you know, the basic framework here, the uh, the the trial design here. Uh, this was a, uh, let's see, it looks like it was probably a phase two trial here. It was double blind, placebo controlled. It was a parallel study. Uh, we've got 788 epileptic patients. Uh, the treatment involved first a 12 week screening phase. So basically, you get, I guess, what you can think of as baseline count data. Uh, and then uh, tr at some point transition then to an active treatment phase where patients were assigned either placebo or pregabalin uh, according to the doses listed here. And I'm still trying to decide if this dose, I was looking at information about pregabalin and I'm still wondering whether these doses are actually correct. Um, I mean, at least in the States, if I was to say 1.8 grams TID, that would mean they were getting uh, 1.8 grams, uh, you know, in, in you know th three times. So, uh, what does that come out to? Uh, what is that six three times that uh, 55? It would be 5.4 grams. I'd sure hesitate to give that much pregabalin. So I, I'm still not sure they've got that right. But that's kind of beside the point for what we're going to focus on here. Um, so, and the actual data we're going to look at is uh, they actually had seizure counts uh, for each day during the study. So we've got 24 weeks over which we've got, uh, you know, we've got a seizure count for every day in that. So whatever 24 times 7 uh, seizure counts per patient here, uh, at least if they completed. Uh, so you can see, yeah, here they said they've had 134,196 daily seizure counts. So that's the data they're working with. Uh, and this gives you uh, some idea of what some typical, uh, you know, typical data that they saw in this. Uh, so you're looking at seizure counts, you've got, and here they've given sort of a, individuals that, you know, range in characteristics in terms of what the data looks like. You can see this first one here is a patient who has, uh, who rarely has more than one seizure within a day, uh, has lots of days with zero seizures, and a small smattering of days with two and one case of three seizures within a day. Uh, compare that with this second individual here who goes through 
you know, on average is running, you know, somewhere in the, uh, typically in the, you know, pushing up into the tens in some cases, though there are a few days that are substantially lower, but a very large number of seizures in the day. Uh, in here, we can see once they went to the treatment phase, they drop substantially, though that's still a quite a few seizures for every day. Uh, another individual here, sort of in between those two, and fairly constant over the entire over the entire study. Uh, you know, and then we've got some that bounce around a lot, and that's the example here. Uh, so anyway, there's a whole a range of characteristics you see here uh, as we look across these patients. Uh, let's, I think they blow it up. Let's go here. Uh, in the subsequent slides, they did a nice job of sort of pointing out uh, this characteristic where we'll seem to go through runs of periods with either low or no seizures and then runs uh, where we have very large amounts, at least in some of the individuals. This is an example. I think in the next slide it... Uh, okay, I see. They We start out with just looking at it kind of raw. Uh, I think this is still all, this is all within this, um, the screening period, I believe. Uh, here they've highlighted <clears throat> some of these things. So basically show in the, the pink here, we've got these fairly low counts in here. And then the, the black are the high ones and sort of by eyeball sort of identified those as two different states, you know, that they labeled as low epileptic activity and then high epileptic activity uh, in here. And let's see if we go, okay. Uh, let's see if there's something we want to say in here, okay. <clears throat> They're starting to lead into the idea of a model as a part of this. So again, they're just and creating some symbolism here. So we've got our, in this case, the YIJ is the number of seizures on the jth day. Uh, let's see, they're doing his jth day and the ith individual. Warning, I'm going to switch the roles of I and J. I didn't pay attention to that on their slides. Um, and that, and they're arguing that J looks like that distribution depends upon a hidden state. So again, they're starting to lead into our hidden Markov model in here. And so they start naming a lambda one for the uh, for our Poisson parameter for state one and lambda two for state two in here. And they've started to mark that off. So they're starting to build the, the model element in here. Uh, and this, they've taken the same data and just connected the dots for uh, observations that occurred on consecutive days. Uh, just to point out that we do appear to have periods where you sort of have runs, uh, you know, of high seizure activity over some period uh, over a few days, uh, then followed by a period of low activity and so on. And the idea is to come up with a model that can describe that sort of transition. I don't think, yeah, there was another, I, uh, if we really wanted to build this up, there was another presentation they've done where they showed the sequence of trying different models and showed how uh, other models were deficient. So, for example, they tried a basic Poisson model, then tried a, uh, you know, a mixed Poisson, mixed effect Poisson model, which did a bit better, uh, but still didn't seem to show these kinds of runs. Uh, and I can't recall if they, whether I think they might have tried a uh, uh, throwing in one of the over dispersed models like a negative binomial, but they tried a number of different models before landing on this one. So that that made a nice story behind this too. Uh, okay, so they ended up arguing then based upon that for a model that they've sort of uh, come up with a schematic here. This idea that under the hood, we've got a sequence of states here. Uh, so these Z's all correspond to the state on a given day. So you've got the Z, you've got the state in day one, day two, day three, and so on as we go all the way up finally to day N in here. And that state uh, then uh, it also then determines the 
the average seizure rate, which in turn drives the, the seizure count itself in here. Um, again, argue this ZIJ then is this hidden Markov chain that has a, a transition matrix. Uh, in this case, it's just a two by two, uh, which fortunately makes programming a little simpler. So it's two by two, uh, but in each case, the uh, R count given the state then is described by a Poisson model. It's just that depending upon which state you're in, you will have a different uh, mean count associated uh, with that Poisson model. Let's see, is there any other? Yeah, there's a little bit more I wanted to tell you about it. Okay, so how, how do we go about building this up into a, a mathematical format? Um, uh, first of all, we're going to need certain parameters. Um, you actually step back. It turns out that you only need, when you've got this 2x2 two two matrix here, you actually don't need to estimate parameters for all of these because, in fact, not all of the parameters are completely independent from e each other. You basically need only two of these probabilities uh, as free parameters, and the other two are then can be derived uh, by difference from those. And the ones they picked in particular was to specify parameters for P11 and P21. And then P12 and P22 are, are determined from those. So, so here, as it says, the transition matrix then is determined by the P11 and P21. And then we also need distributions. I'm sorry, no, we also need parameters for R2. Uh, average uh, event rates here and the parameterization that they chose you can see here uh, they pretty much threw random effects on everything also remind you right now this is uh, just the model for just the screening phase of the study we haven't even started talking about the impact of drug yet so here you can see they used a logit transformation for the probabilities so we've got essentially our, our mean logit of p11 is is beta one and then some random effect here. So this uh, this eta one is, you know, then is uh, a random effect, w which in this case will be normally distributed with mean zero. Same sort of deal for log of p two one. Uh, the log of lambda one here uh, is also going to be described as normal. In other words, lambda one is log normal in this case, and uh, so we've got. Uh, our mean, they just call lambda 1, and then again a random effect, normally distributed. Uh, this alpha here is actually the difference between lambda 2 and lambda 1. Uh, that's log transformed also to, uh, to restrict alpha to be non-negative. Uh, so the result is, is this enforces the, uh, the order restriction so that lambda 2 will always be greater than or equal to lambda 1 in here. Again, we've got a random effect on that, uh, and that was described in terms of a uh, multivariate normal in here. So again, we are, so our parameters that we're going to be dealing with then are going to be your beta 1, beta 2, lambda 1, alpha, and all of the elements of our, our variance matrix. Uh, let's see. Okay, and they were commenting they wanted to treat two mixed hidden Markov models simultaneously, screening phase versus treatment phase, although in this case the treatment phase is really just a uh, sort of a modification. of. It's not like they're fundamentally different models. They are, uh, we basically just got a different set of parameters for some of the components uh, during, the, uh, during the treatment phase. Uh, and that's shown here, so we already went through what you see on the left. On the right, basically all of these things that you see on the left are modified by throwing in a, uh, you can see a, a delta component for each one of those, which you could sort of think of as being like a, uh, sort of like a placebo, uh, placebo effect on these, because during the treatment phase that gets added whether or not the whether or not you have an active dose given to the patient, uh, and then just a linear uh, function of dose uh, on all of the parameters uh, for the model they're using. 
Uh, and let's see, in addition, they threw some additional random effects on all these deltas uh, in their model. Let's see, uh, I won't worry about model two because the one we're going to base our example on is actually going to be the model one. So I'll skip past that. Uh, at that point, they start going through the algorithm that they used uh, within the uh, SAEM approach uh, within Monolix and described how, basically how they solved the problem with Monolix. Let's see if there's any other bits we really want to hit on here. Uh, no, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think the core that I wanted to get to is this notion then of coming up with a using this hidden Markov model to describe these a way of describing this type of autocorrelation where we see these runs of you know values in a region and then a jump to a sort of another state where again we see runs but at a different level and, and again they their big focus was gee how did they come up with a way of implementing this in a maximum likelihood context and what I'll do is show you um, doing it in a in a Bayesian framework instead using wind bugs. So the the model we're actually going to to develop here is actually going to be almost the same as the one you do here. Uh, the differences I'm going to make uh, for the sake of not having the run times being too absurdly long is I've eliminated the random effects down here on the deltas uh, and I've reduced the sample size uh, so I'm only going to have 25 patients per treatment arm. So we'll have a total of 100 patients as opposed to 70, is it 100? I forget how many doses, is that right? Or is it 125? I forgot how many doses we have. Four. We have four. I think I included a placebo treatment in mine. I'll double check. Forget whether it's 100 or 125. I do know it's 25 per treatment arm. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, as an example here. Okay, before I go on to our to actually implementing the example, any questions on uh, what we've been looking at so far before I go on to actually trying to implement this in bugs? Nothing popping up so far here, so I'll keep my eye open, though. Uh, let's go back to our other slide set here. Okay, so the example, let's see here. Uh, got one from Andreas. So it says, so this model assumes an immediate stable over time treatment effect, uh, correct? Uh, sounds not very realistic at first glance. And yeah, uh, the model, as, as they had implemented, did essentially assume that. They essentially assumed that the, uh, that the effect of pregabalin and, and the, any placebo effect that might be there came on uh, right away and continued... Uh, constantly over time and the only thing that changed was this uh, you know this random Markov process under the hood so so yeah it's a fairly it's sim fairly simplistic from that point of view um, on the other hand there'd be nothing to, that could to preclude incorporating a time dependence in fact I noticed and so let me take a quick run back to the other side set here if you look at their model two, they did at least attempt to uh, incorporate a time dependency in there. Let's see where to go. 
Yeah, if you look at this, uh, their Model 2, they did attempt to include a time dependency uh, in the in the effect over here. So the essentially one where the uh, where it would come up gradually over time with a couple of rate constants associated with the uh, development of the treatment of a f treatment effect. Okay, so for the example I'm actually going to work through here then uh, is I'm going to, I don't actually have the data they did, I'm going to simulate uh, based upon uh, based upon the same model I'm going to fit to it. I basically took, uh, took what was reported uh, in their slide sets, uh, constructed a slightly simplified model, slightly in the sense that I knocked out some of the random effects uh, within the model and simulated uh, simulated from that. Though whether I get something exactly the same, I was a little unsure because some of their parameters, well for the most part they didn't report the units of the parameters they had, so I had to make some assumptions there and whether I really got them right or not I was a bit uncertain. Uh, but but in terms of showing you how to implement it, that's kind of a moot point. Just don't interpret this as being a meaningful statement about pregabalin. Um, so in the example I simulated then, as I've got five treatment arms, 0, 600, 900, 1,200, and 1,800 milligrams per day. Uh, same schedule as in their original work. So I've got a 12-week screening phase followed by a 12-week treatment phase. Uh, then I've got 25 uh, patients per arm, and uh, the data will be the daily seizure counts. Uh, the model uh, I'm going to suggest here is is pretty much the same as what they did, except for the reduction in um, uh, the reduction in the number of random effects here. I've also written it a bit differently here uh, in a way that in, is perhaps more readily uh, translatable to the bugs language. Okay, so what I've got here then is I've got our Poisson model for the number of seizures on the ith observation day in the jth patient. Uh, and I've got average seizure accounts that vary between two values according to a Markov process. So again, essentially the same model. So my number of seizures in the uh, on the ith day and the jth patient then is going to be Poisson distributed uh, with some mean count uh, that again varies by time and patient. Uh, that mean count you can see will vary depending upon, well it also depends upon yeah, on time in sort of two ways in terms of the Markov process as well as the fact that we have different characteristics during the screening and treatment phase. So you'll see superscripts throughout here of screen or treat to indicate whether or not these parameters are applicable to the screening or the treatment phase. And in the case of lambda, we're going to again, we're going to, I'm going to use two states. So again, it's a fairly simple Markov process in that sense. We could do, construct a model for more states, uh, but we'll just stick with the two. Uh, so we've got, you can see a lambda 1 in the screening phase, so that's the lambda that would apply if the, uh, you know, if the ith state in the jth patient is 1 and we're in the screening phase. In other words, and the way I construct the time scale is time is negative during the screening phase and positive in the, in the treatment phase, so that's why it says t, t less than or equal to 0. Uh, and for state 2, you can see we've got a lambda 2 screen, same deal, and then the same thing for the two, uh, for our two states within the treatment phase. Uh, now the state itself is the thing then that's described by our Markov process. So the state on the ith day in the jth patient is determined by a categorical distribution, uh, where again we have a Pij, so this, so we've got this probability. This in this case, it's a vector of two values. So you've got the 
probability of going to state one and the probability of going to state two uh, in here. Uh, they're actually complementary, so the one is equal to one minus the other. Uh, so, and that can again vary both by time and and by the individual. Uh, and you can, here's the whole mess written out here. So let's start out to the first case here. We've got. Uh, this the pair that would apply let's say you've got a situation where the previous state and that's what I'm indicating here by the I minus 1 so if the state of the system on the I minus first day uh, equals 1 and we're in the screening phase okay but again it's the important thing here is our, our the state in the previous day uh, is 1 then the probability of going to state 1 or remaining in state 1 would be P11 and the probability of going to state 2 will be P12 uh, in here. Uh, so that's why we have that pair and that's and so if you had a patient in the screening phase who is currently in state 1 this is the pair that you would stick in into this argument here in our categorical distribution on the other hand if they were in state 2 I would want to use P21 and P22 as the pair that I put into my categorical distribution uh, and then the next two down here are for the corresponding uh, probability pairs for the treatment phase Okay. So that's that's really right here is really the core of that Markov process uh as part of this. Yeah, because once you have that, the rest of this is a little bit of bookkeeping plus a Poisson distribution. Uh then a few more pieces. Uh we have our random effects right here. Uh, and all this gibberish is basically just saying that this sequence of values here are the logit of P11, the logit of P21, the, lo the log of lambda1, and the log of the difference between lambda2 and lambda1 is that set of parameters. Uh, are Those are normally distributed uh, and according to with some set of means as well as a, a, in this case, a 4 by 4 variance matrix. Okay. And then once we have our two probabilities here, our P11 and our P21, we can then calculate the other two. So we can get our P12 and our P22 just by our simple difference here of going like 1 minus P11 and excuse me, in 1 minus P2, 1. So that actually up to that point we've taken care of our, our screening phase. Uh, the next bits here are then getting the corresponding parameters for our treatment phase by, by alterations on the screening phase parameters. So you can see here I've got the logit of P11 is going to be P11 in the, for the treatment phase is going to be the logit of the P11 in the screening phase plus our lambda 1 plus lambda sorry our delta 1 plus gamma 1 times dose. Uh, gee what possessed me to use asterisk that time I don't know. Um, you know similar relationship for P21 for treatment uh, and then for our lambdas, again, a similar pattern. So here I've used uh, the same thing that was used in the, uh, you know, in the in the work we just looked at from Delatra at L. So again, the core thing which is different here is I did not put random effects on the deltas. Let's see what's going to be next. Okay. Okay, so that's our core model. Now, one of the questions that comes up when dealing with a Markov chain like this is what do you do about the initial case? What do you do for this, our initial state? 
because the way you write the model, in fact, I'll step back, you can see the way we write the model here is all of these probabilities, the way we determine this probability pair here, this PIJ, uh, depends upon what we have for the previous state. So we've got this for any given individual's set of data, we've got this whole sequence of values and the way we construct the likelihood for for one val for the values at one point in time depends upon what we had for the previous point in time. But but then what do I do for the first time? Where I I don't how do I begin that sequence? Especially in a case like this where the Markov component here is not an observable quantity, it's a modeled quantity. I don't I can't for instance just say, oh well I'll just use the the observed state. Well there is no observed state uh, in this case. So how do I deal with that? So that's the question that I'm posing here is you know, is, is how do I model the probability of each state at the first observation time? And I suggest two options uh, that you could consider. Uh, one option is you you basically just add new parameters that correspond to the initial probabilities. Uh, and there would actually be multiple ways in which you could do that. You know, if I step back here, I suppose what I could do is for, you know, for our state one case, is what I would do is I would maybe have a maybe a p0 parameter uh, in this case I guess it would probably be and I only need it for one because the other one will be one minus that so uh, I would probably have like a p0 for for a typical value and then maybe have and then maybe put a random effect on it so I've got a different initial state for or different initial state for each individual or different probability of the initial state and I would just estimate them and that's that's a perfectly reasonable strategy so in effect I've added at least two parameters there uh, the the sort of like a population mean and a, and a variance associated with it so that's that's one strategy uh, that's not the one I, I used here uh, instead I uh, used a property um, that at least some Markov systems uh, have. Um, with it, you know, for how do I put this here? Um, well, I'll just say that many Markov processes uh, will, you know, if you don't change. Uh, if you don't change the component probabilities. Uh, the transition probabilities over time, uh, you can think of them as essentially going to a sort of something analogous to a steady state, where, um, and what we actually call that would do, there's different names that you'll see out there, but usually what we would call that is a, it, it in the limit, it converges to a stationary distribution. Uh, this is much the same rationale that we use with our with our MCMC simulation. So ba another way of putting it is eventually over time the system forgets its starting point uh, and you can sort of describe the sort of the marginal probability that uh, uh, for being in any given state at a particular time which becomes then independent of that well, it's not truly independent of the past history, I suppose, but uh, in the ignorance of the past history, you could you could specify such probabilities. So what I'm going to do here is assume that the Markov process has continued long enough prior to the study uh, under conditions that are comparable to the screening phase. Uh, and the reason for saying that is because I'd like to use some of the same parameters in my model. In particular, I'd like to use the screening phase parameters uh, in in this. And so if those screening phase parameters are arguably descriptive of what happened for some period of time prior to the study starting, then I could make an argument that, okay, well, may, that, well I could make a plausible argument that the system would be at this steady state or 
in here, or in other words, that the stationary distribution would be applicable for determining the um, determining the uh, what's the word I'm looking for the marginal probabilities for for each state in here, and that's what I'm arguing here. And it turns out for this particular simple two-state model the the probabilities then those marginal probabilities are what you see here uh it's these ratios here where the probability uh the probability that the initial state is 1 is this ratio here of p21 over p12 plus p21 and the probability of being in state 2 will be p12 over p12 plus p21 uh so that that is so if you're willing to make that assumption uh you've eliminated the necessity of incorporating some uh, additional parameters to estimate uh, as part of this and that's the approach i'm going to use here uh now as you get to more and more complex models uh actually sitting down and pounding through the calculation of what this stationary state looks like can get increasingly messy uh but at least for the 2 by 2 case it's pretty straight ahead Okay, so this actually takes us to uh, actually doing this. Let's uh, find my directory with the stuff in it here. Okay, so I sent, uh, or not sent, but I uh, I posted on on the course website then uh, a few pieces here. Uh, in particular, what I posted were uh, what I've got labeled here is this hmmexample.r and hmmexample.txt, uh, the R script and uh, and bugs model for this example. I also gave you uh, the equivalent model, but with no uh, inter-individual variation. Uh, in other words, no random effects in it uh, that I had used as a some for, to initially sort of work up work up the code uh it's a process i'll sometimes do in a case like this where i've got a particularly messy model uh just to make sure that i've got the just sort of the core code for the model correct and then layer in the uh, the random effects as part of it in fact maybe that's the place i'll start uh as, as a way of showing you the model uh in here because it's a little bit simpler uh let me go ahead and open that Oh, and the other thing I've given you is the data, and maybe I'll, after that fires up here, let me fire up the data. So you see what kind of a structure we've got. Okay, so it's fairly simple data set here. You got a patient identifier, uh, dose, time, and and number of seizures. In here, the time in this case is just days, uh, where zero is the transition between the screening and treatment phase in this case. Um, so that's why you see minus uh, at the start of this. Um, in here and you can see a few seizure counts right there as we go through this you know you'll see some patients with a large number of seizures some with smaller amounts as you, if you wander through that so that's our our data in there uh, in fact let's take another look at the data here uh is that what i want i think this will give me what i want Okay, and this is uh, another view uh, of the data. You can see these are similar to the sorts of plots we saw uh, from the, the slides we were looking at. So on the y-axis, you've got number of seizures. On the x, the days, the, the red vertical line here is just the break between uh, screening and treatment. 
Uh, in this case, you're looking at the placebo group uh, in here. Uh, and you can see things bouncing around. You have, you know, and some variation among patients. For example, here in the lower right-hand corner, you can see you've got a patient who tends to have, uh, well, the highest number of seizures in a day was two, a uh, number of days with one, and then even more days with zero uh, seizures in here. And then you'll find a few others that are similar to that, but then you'll find some that will have higher numbers, uh, Here's one, for example, that uh, has a day here that shoots up to 12, but a number of days that, uh, you know, that are running in the sort of 6 to 8 range, for example. I don't think I have any in this case that are really high. No, I don't have any really high ones in this case. And a few more over here. Uh, and then uh, also you can see uh, that in some cases you do have a uh, in some patients, you seem to have a transition when you get into the treatment phase, some none. That would arguably be something you would describe as a placebo effect uh, in these. Uh, actually, let's wander up to one of the higher dose levels here. Uh, actually, I expected to see a bigger effect there. Uh, it actually bounces around quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised I'm not seeing a more marked drug effect with that in this particular batch. Uh, a few that are a little bit more here, but you can get some idea of the kinds of uh, kinds of data that you're seeing, how they vary from patient to patient, and you can see some hints of some of the apparent Markovian uh, qualities in some of these. Okay, so that's the data we're going to work with. Okay, and let's see how we implement a a model to describe that. Let's uh, clean this up a little bit. Make it a bit bigger. Oh, I seem to have pushed the wrong button here just a moment. So I fix that up. Uh, yeah, I'll start it over again. Let's do that again. Okay, let's try that again. Push the wrong buttons. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, do I really want to see? You know what? I am going to go back to the original one rather than the one with no. Um, because I forgot the way I did it as I started out by writing the full model and then, uh, and then modified it so it actually doesn't look all that much simpler. So let's just go with the model I already described to you. Okay. Okay, so here's uh, here's where we're going to go here. So we've got, again, this is going to be our hidden Markov model. Um, let's see, where do I want to begin? Let's actually begin sort of where we, uh, let's go back up here. There we are. You know, so down inside this inner loop here. In fact, let me basically describe the overall loops first. I've got an outer loop here, which goes, you can see it says J goes from one to N patients in here. Uh, and then down, down here, I have a loop that you can see I've got, a, I'm saying I'm gonna go from I in, what I labeled as start J plus one to N J. And this start, and end are in the data set and they basically describe uh, they, they tell it where which record the start j is the record uh, in our is the data record where containing the first observation for uh, first observation for the jth individual and nj is tells you what uh, the last 
the la the last observation then or it tells you the row containing the last observation for that and then so I'm doing that way instead of using separate loops I'm using nested loops in this case uh, and then my likelihood you can see I've got here's the main one here I well I called it count in this case instead of n seizures uh, so my ith count here is going to be Poisson uh, with some mean count lambda j uh, the lambda j uh, in here is where do we go here uh, this gets complicated by again the fact that the data could conceivably be from either the screening phase or from the treatment phase what I've done is I've created a data item called I screen which equals 1 if the data is from the screening phase equals 0 if it's from the treatment phase so that's the way I split these up so you can see I've got I screen times the lambda associated with the screening phase or 1 minus I screen times the lambda associated with the treatment phase and then for each one of those phases you can see there's two possible lambdas uh, depending upon what the state is so you can see here this has got a uh, lambda screen so first of all it's going to have a value specific to the jth individual because it's got a random effect but then it's also there's going to be one lambda for state one and one for state two uh, so I've got to so and that's and I've just called those two states state so state I here indicates then the uh, the state of our Markov process at the ith time and that state is determined by our categorical distribution here so that's where you see state I tilde decat uh, with our probabilities so that statement right there is the equivalent of this statement uh, in our in in the slides that you see here and then there's a bunch of stuff that's basically bookkeeping to assign the appropriate values to the probability matrix that's there and notice what I've got here so for my the probability of state one I have I I have a couple of possibilities so the probability that you're going to enter state one or that that you're in state one at the ith time uh, it's got to be either P11 or P21 uh, and which one of those you use depends upon what the previous state was so if the previous state was state 2 then I'd want to use 21 if the previous state was state 1 then I'd want to use P11 here and you can see the trick I use for that is right here I use the equals function uh, within WinBugs and I can and I use you can see here I've got state but instead of looking for state I I've got state I minus one in here uh, so it's asking well if the previous state was one then use P11 if the previous state was two then use P21 and then of course the second probability you just get by subtracting it from one uh, let's see here what's the next thing to tell here okay similar to what we did with lambda where we have different values for the lambdas depending upon whether you're in the screening and treatment phase same thing is true for our probabilities and so here you can see where I've done the same thing in terms of our P11 and P21 in there okay let's see so that's the core there now the part that I, I skipped over here before jumping into the likelihood is notice that this loop here does not begin at start J it begins at start J plus one uh, and so what I've shown you so far is the likelihood for 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 basically the second observation for a given individual to their last one but I had to but what I haven't shown you is dealing with the first observation
And that's where we again get into this issue of what do you do for the probabilities for that first one. And I showed you the, the approach where I assume we've uh, reached a stationary distribution. And that's what's going on right here. Uh, so in, in this statement right here, I've actually got this first statement is actually our likelihood for the count, uh, for that first count within the individual. That's why you see count start J uh, in here. So that's going to be, again, Poisson uh, with a particular lambda in it. And the state statement looks very similar to the other. What's different is how I got these probabilities for the first case, and that's this statement right here, where again I've assumed that we've achieved the uh, stationary distribution for those probabilities, and I, and the, so these two statements right here are equivalent to what you see down here uh, on the slide. So I take care of my initial state here before I go into loop that goes over the other observations. That's also part of the, that also drove this process of using nesting loops instead of using a completely separate loop. I found it easier to do that uh, when I did it as a nested set of loops. Uh, the only extra bit of uh, thing that sort of encumbers you on that is you have to, as part of your data set, provide the series of start and end values uh, within the data set. So we have to do a little bookkeeping in the R script uh, in which we're going to create the data set for this. Uh, let's see, what am I missing we haven't talked about? Um, well, we haven't put together uh, the, uh, the random effects on this uh, that ultimately feeds into these probabilities we've been looking at. Because down here we're looking at things like lambdas, or on the right here I guess the lambdas for each individual, and this P11 and P21 for each individual. Well, up on top here uh, is where a lot of the work is going on for that. So in one statement right here I make a call to a multivariate normal distribution to create a set of random effects. Uh, so here I've got, so these thetas are actually going to be my various parameters here. Uh, so you've got this mean here, a theta hat, and my, uh, by the way, I don't think, I think this is the first time I've used the multivariate normal in this course, haven't I? Uh, this omega inverse is, uh, is an inverse of the variance matrix. So I guess you could call that a precision matrix. And again, it's using that same convention that Winbugs uses for the univariate normal. It uses a precision instead of a variance in here. Um, and then the thetas here are all associated with the various parameters that we've already come to know and love here. So I've got it parameterized in such a way that the logit of our P11 for our screening phase is our first theta, uh, the P21 is the second theta, uh, and then uh, so I've taken care of that. Down here I've taken care of what we talked, the additional components needed for the treatment phase. So you can see the delta and gamma times dose uh, component over here. Uh, then we've got our mean count components which are associated with the third and the fourth theta out of those. So I've well, in particular, we've got the log of lambda 1 is going to be that third theta, and the log of the difference in the lambdas is the fourth theta, and here I take care of adding them back together here to get my, my lambda 2. Uh, and then, again, doing the additional modifications to add the, uh, the treatment effects into the lambdas. No, I think I've hit on all those pieces. Now, the one thing I didn't talk about at all, and even on my slides, is priors on these things. Uh, the priors I've chosen are, I think it's still fair to call them weakly informative, but I did put some bounds on them uh, to try and keep the uh, numerical behavior of this thing in line a bit. Uh, now, some are fairly obvious and are very much... 
uh, what you'd call weakly or non-informative. So for my two probabilities, P11 and P21, I just used uniform 0 to 1 in, a, in their probabilities, so they have to be between 0 and 1. Uh, for the lambdas, I use pretty flat normals here uh, on both of the, the lambda 1 and the difference between the lambdas. Uh, or it's actually not the difference, but the log of the difference there. Uh, the deltas and the gammas I got a bit tighter on, uh, but again, it turns out when you look at the posteriors on these, is uh, the the posterior samples stay pretty far from those, so I I don't think these are likely to be very influential. Though if I haven't said it enough before, uh, I would still recommend that for any of these where you might have any doubts as to the extent to which they are or are not informative, it would be wise to do some sensitivity analysis. Uh, the gammas look sort of informative, but again, the scale of the gammas were fairly small because these are multiplying uh, the dose, so you're multiplying quantities like 1800, for example. Uh, in here, uh, this just points out, well, I guess, let's see, I guess I used uh, these named quantities, logit p11 hat and log lambda 1 hat and so on, when I provided the initial estimates here. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, it must have been true. I'm trying to remember in uh, what I did on some of these things. So, yeah, I did. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because I set the priors based upon those. And here I'm just assigning them all to elements of a, the same vector so that I can use them within uh, this multivariate normal, which requires a vector-valued quantity here. I can't put a list inside that. I actually have to put it in the form of a vector. So... That, oops, that's the reason, excuse me, okay, for doing these statements here where I assign it to the elements of a vector. Uh, and then finally down here is where I deal with the, uh, uh, deal with the variance matrix. Uh, the approach here is to make it relatively, to make it weakly informative is I use a Wishart distribution for the, for the inverse of our variance matrix uh, with a number of degrees of freedom equal to the number of uh, of items the to the dimension uh, of our uh, of our matrix and that results in in a fairly weakly informative prior for that and then just for reporting purposes I go ahead and use the inverse function in here to get the uh, actual variance matrix which is what I what I actually monitor when I ran this I think I've got all the elements of that covered in here. Okay, so that's the implementation. The big, you know, the big tricks in here is this dependency on that you see in statements like this. I mean, this is really where the Markov stuff is happening, is where I'm having this probability uh, uh, that applies to the ith state depending upon the the i minus first state. So that's the critical part. Now it's also uh, going to turn out that uh, this is probably stretching the capabilities of WinBugs a little bit. I think I've commented before that WinBugs is uh, is not really a procedural language in the sense of something like C or Fortran or even R. Uh, and so when you see a for loop like this, it doesn't quite mean the same thing in uh, in WinBugs that it does in something like, you know, like C. It's, uh, you know, this is a set of instructions to WinBugs for what the model structure is. It's not a set of instructions for how to calculate the values, uh, at least not in a direct sense. Uh, so when this, when WinBugs tries to parse this and generate the appropriate, um, you know, the appropriate overall likelihood function, and come up with a sampling scheme, it struggles when you have these kinds of dependencies uh, among observations like this. 
uh, and sometimes it produces okay code and sometimes not so okay. Uh, but almost always, if you have this kind of sequential dependency, it's probably going to be pretty slow code because it's not what WinBugs was sort of optimized for. And that's one of the things you'll see if you try to run this, that even after I reduce the number of patients and... Uh, reduce the number of patients and reduce the number of random effects this still runs pretty slowly I didn't carefully measure the time but I know I uh, we're talking oh what was it I think we're talking probably boy somewhere between 12 and 18 hours anyway to run this uh, to do a single run where I've got let's see this was three chains of 10,000 in this uh, so that's that's sort of an issue uh, in working with bugs this is an example where if you really wanted to use a Bayesian framework the optimal approach would actually be to write some custom code that takes advantage of the underlying structure of the model rather than trying to use a general purpose package like WinBugs okay so there's the the core model let's go ahead and just pull up the R script Yeah, let's make that bigger too. Uh, let's see. Uh, nothing substantially new at the beginning, other than the names as usual. Uh, I don't think I added any new libraries, no. And so, of course, I'm pulling in the seizure data. I've got some stuff here for doing the uh, exploratory plots. I think we can sort of skip that. Okay, so the data here, they're actually... You know, the main thing I've added is probably this bit of constructing this the start and end objects. Other than that, there isn't a lot you have to do with it. So, so what do we got here? So I want to calculate the number of observations. Uh, here, what I've done is come up with a trick for generating a vector containing the indexes of the first observations for each individual patient. So that's all that's going on here. This not duplicated thing uh, returns a true uh, for the first observation uh, where a given where this value has you know this value is there. So the patient identifier. So where the face where you it first sees a particular value, uh, this is going to get a true and it's going to be a false otherwise. Uh, and then I use the and then I use the sequence of one to our number of observations, and by doing that combination, it'll just return a list of of integers that correspond to the rows of our uh, where the first observation is for each patient. So, but I got to pass in the number of patients. I pass in that start vector. I can pass the equivalent of the end vector is pretty easy. I basically just take uh, my my starts and and return the value that's just before that and that will be the end of that will be the last observation for the previous patient so this is just a, a little bit of bookkeeping to get that in there I uh, recall I used eye screen as an indicator for whether or not the data came from the screening or treatment phase uh, and that was just determined based upon whether or not uh, the time was less than or equal to zero so you can see I've done that in here by basically first doing a logical so you get trues and falses when I do an as numeric on on a on a logical here it converts the trues to one and the and the falses to zero I uh, pass the dose uh, the way I set this up is I only wanted to pass uh, the dose once for each individual uh, and I pass my seizure counts, and then I also incorporated a prior. I pass the uh, information about the for the prior distribution on my omega inverse. Uh, let's see here, and then I got a bunch of initial estimates here, which were based pretty heavily upon the uh, uh, the values that were used for doing the simulation, but incorporated some random. Uh, random number generators here so that I had 
different values for each chain. Said what I wanted to save. Uh, for this run, I actually I had a problem for some reason when I tried to run this with the posterior predictions. Uh, I had a problem with it. Uh, by the way, the one comment here in general is, in many ways, what I'm showing you isn't completely ready for prime time because this was uh, uh, trying to write some fairly difficult code with a difficult model with uh, uh, sort of on the fly here. So I haven't had a chance to really polish it up. Uh, I When I tried to get the posterior predictions, tried to monitor those, for some reason, wind bugs threw an error when it tried to save the values, and I haven't had time to dig into what caused it to fail. So that's why you see here on the other RVs, I did not save any of these predicted values for either the state or the counts. Uh, somewhere down the line, I may try to diagnose what went wrong there and why I couldn't seem to capture those. Uh, what I would do if I want to do some posterior predictions under this kind of a circumstance is I would do the simulations in R after the fact rather than doing them within within bugs. And given how slow the code tends to be for this Markov process, that might be the best strategy anyway. Um, so I ran this three chains, 10,000 each, 5,000 burn in per chain. Um, probably not much to tell about this stuff down here. Uh, now what we get when we do that, pull this up. Uh, let's go ahead and pull up the parameter estimates first. Yeah, let's knock that down one here. Um, you can already begin to see when we look at the effect of N here that some of it's probably not going to be too pretty. Uh, you can see there's a number of parameters in this where the effect of N is less than 100, uh, which is pretty poor. Uh, you know, So you can see, for example, our P11 hat and our P21 hat, those are pretty two pretty important parameters that uh, you can see the precision is going to be pretty low because of that. Uh, so and there's a number of others as you start going down here. So uh, you can see it, it's kind of struggling with this, and that becomes even more evident when we look at. Uh, oops, let me not quite there. When we start looking at the chains here. Uh, as you can see, we've got some chains that look quite ugly. Uh, gamma clearly didn't converge at all, uh, and some of them just behave strangely in ways that aren't clearly non complete non-convergence, but definitely there's some extreme autocorrelation in some of these things. Uh, so this clearly was not an adequate run for this. And as I say, this was done on the fly, so I haven't had a chance to go through and diagnose what might be, what might be the issue on this. Um, I've done some basic simulation runs without data on this, and the code itself seems to run okay. Uh, so uh, at this point, I don't know whether it's extreme correlation amongst parameters or, or, or maybe something like... Uh, you know, or whether it's a, an identifiability problem uh, or what in this instance. So it's not looking too good. Uh, I did sort of look at the parameter, you know, like the 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 means of the MCMC samples compared to the the numbers I use for simulation. They're they're certainly not great, but they're not that bad either. So it's like most of the numbers are in the right general ballpark, but uh, but this is certainly nowhere near adequate for inferences whether it would be if you let it run for many more iterations I can't say uh, but we do know that this number of iterations took an extremely long time uh, so I doubt it uh, one thing that makes me suspect that part of the problem may be identifiability however 
is I did do a run without inter-occasion variability uh, within the model. And when you do that, uh, there we go, here, here it is. I'll show you what we see there. It's not perfect, but it's 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 markedly better. And and in fact, you could argue that uh, for rough inferences, this is probably okay. I'd probably want to increase the number of iterations by a factor of five to ten if I wanted to use it for for production work on here. So this suggests to me that the data is enough to support the simpler model without random effects and it's only when I introduce the random effects that it um, uh, that it seemed to be having difficulty so this could just simply be that uh, with the amount of data with this smaller number of subjects and such may may just be insufficient for for identifying uh, all of those parameters but at this point I'm I'm not certain I haven't had enough time to go through and try and evaluate uh, the capabilities. So, uh, but the good thing about this is, I guess, it also convinced me that the core of this uh, was functioning. You know, the the sort of the core of the model was functioning correctly uh, as part of this. So, so this is an example where if I was doing this in a production setting, I'd be spending a fair amount of time with this data, trying to or with this model. Uh, exploring what might be going on here, uh, seeing if there were modifications to the, either to the model or the way I've parameterized the model uh, to more adequately uh, describe the, the data and get better MCMC performance out of this. Uh, but at this point, I'd be guessing as to what might resolve the issue we see here. Uh, uh, so, again, I'd it would require quite a bit more diagnostics as, as part of this. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to... Oh, I know something uh, I did want to tell you about this. Uh, one problem I ran into with this is is probably worth showing you uh, as to, to give you a um, a potential, a remedy to a problem that you can sometimes run into with wind bugs. When I first ran this, I kept on getting a trap uh, within WinBugs uh, that was indicating that it, you know, that I was getting, um, I'm trying to remember how the error is phrased. Uh, I forget what the phrase, uh, the exact phrase that it uses, but basically indicating that I've, you know, I've got an error uh, in terms of uh, some real number calculation in here, uh, and, you know, indicating I've probably tried to do something like take the log of a negative value, for example. And, and I've often run into that with the adapt adaptive rejection sampling sampler uh, within WinBugs. Uh, and when I run into that and don't seem to be able to get around it, uh, there actually is a trick uh, for dealing with that, and I thought it might be worth uh, at least briefly showing you that particular trick. Let me fire this guy up here. Uh, I guess I can fire up either one of these. Take a second for bugs to open up here. Actually, while we're waiting for that to fire up, you know, certainly if you have questions here, uh, feel free to to fire them in. Yep, showed up on the wrong screen. There we go. Okay, let me open up their user manual here, just to point something out to you. Okay, let's go to, let's see, I think it's in the, under tricks, the advanced, is that part of it? Hmm. 
No, that's not where I wanted. Maybe it's under tips. Oh, no, here it is. It's under the changing MCMC defaults, advanced users only. Uh, and it talks about uh, defaults for sampling methods. Okay, open up. There we go here. Um, can I make that bigger? Let's see. It's not letting me select that to make it bigger. Let's see what happens if I... I'm not sure it's going to let me do this. Eh, it didn't let me change it. Okay, you may want to do this on your own screen since I'm sure this is pretty hard to read. But what it points out to is it's possible to change the sampling methods that WinBugs uses. And in particular, there's a file in in the in that whole pile of files within the the WinBugs folder. Uh, there's one called in the updater folder in there called methods.odc and you actually edit that uh, to change the choice of sampler that it uses uh, for certain cases uh, and what I did and let me go ahead and open let's see do I have that already open now let's go ahead and open one Okay, what I'm doing here is going to, um, this is one where I've actually already set this up uh, this way. Let me show you what the, the original, uh, oops, cut that out. Oh, that's right, it's not going to let me do it that way, is it? Come on. while I get to the file here. Let's see, that's going to be here. So I'm going to go, so I'm in the WinBugs directory here inside your program files. So I've gone from program files down to WinBugs 1.4 and now I'm going to go to updater and then to RSRC, presumably short for resources. And what you'll see in there is now I've added some these two files, methods orig and methods slice. Uh, but the thing that you'll see in your own right now will just be methods. My recommendation if you're going to do this is uh, make a copy of methods.odc, name it something like methods original, so that you'll always have the original there. Now, if we look at the original version, You'll see a bunch of stuff in here. Let's make this bigger so we can see it. I think it'll let me do that. Oh, it runs them all together. That's not good. Let's try and size down. It's not too bad. Um, you can see it lists different classes of, of observations or forms of things and in here on the middle of this table and on the right hand side it says which updater it uses for them. Now the one that's frequently given me trouble uh, is this guy here. Uh, this uh, this updater D free ARS. The D free ARS stands for derivative free adaptive rejection sampler. Uh, and I've often found things like uh, you know like attempt to you know to take the log of a negative number or something happening uh, in the updater and you'll see that as the, the primary lead and you, if you look down uh, like one of the, the next set of statements in the in the trap will will make reference to uh, to this updater D free ARS in there and if you see that uh, then that may be a clue to consider changing which uh, sampler is used Let's see here. We got a question from Jasper here. Let's see if I can see that. Uh, 
Uh, well, to give the short answer to your question, uh, Jasper, is no. I don't know what what causes that, um, and and it would be hard to exp- off the top of my head. It would hard, be hard to explain a negative PD uh, in here. So I'll, I'll guess I'll. I'll leave you to ponder that and maybe take a look at some of David Spiegelhalter's um, stuff on the DIC. Uh, he's been the primary contributor there and conceivably might find something. But, but yeah, negative PD is not is at least not consistent with the sort of intuitive description that's been used for what PD is. Okay, let's see. Go back here. We've got so. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is just take this where it says update or defree ARS and use something else. Now I have to use something else that can work for that. For instance, if I tell it to use the multivariate normal updater, that's not going to work. Uh, what will work for that and is a fairly robust sampler is to use a slice sampler and to replace that. Uh, so to replace that with a slice sampler. And in fact, if we go back to uh, in this particular one where I'm doing this you can see okay again let me make that bigger uh, you can see in this version here where I had up where for log concave it had updater d free ARS I have now for log concave I have updater slice now the, the upside to it is the updater slice tends to be more robust. It's less likely to throw errors of that type. Uh, the downside is the slice sampler tends to be slower. Uh, so, so there is a trade-off when you do this. So if you can use the, uh, the derivative-free ARS method, you're better off. But if you can't, the slice uh, can do that. So you can replace it like that and then run your model uh, and, and see if that works. And in the example that I did, that is what I had done because uh, other changes uh, that I attempted weren't sufficient to correct the problem. In fact, one of the reasons I ran out of time to maybe polish this up a little better was just dealing with that problem uh, as part of this. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, any other parts of the story I wanted to tell on this. No, nothing's immediately coming to mind, though certainly feel free to ask any questions. I'm sure I've left some loose ends as part of this. Oh, and one thing I need to mention, uh, unrelated to that, uh, is there won't be any class this Thursday, um, depending upon what pieces of time I can carve out, I may try to do a, a recording to, to replace it, but we don't actually have a, a, a formal assignment um, in here. In fact, maybe I should make one. Uh, what, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to go ahead and attempt to work with this, uh, this case, uh, admittedly a somewhat difficult uh, set of data, or, di or at least difficult set of data using this model. Uh, and uh, and work with it, um, you know. And if questions come up when the, come up as a result of that, uh, suggest you go ahead and uh, and send questions uh, through the our, our website forums in here, and I'll be glad to respond to those. Uh, so our next class will actually be a week from today, uh, and. You know what? I still hadn't locked in. I sort of had a tie between the uh, uh, what was the two cases? We had the uh, time to event with uh, continuous, you know, with time varying uh, hazard, and I'm drawing a blank at what the other one was. I'd have to go back to the list, but there was a choice between two, and I hadn't uh, hadn't locked in on which one I was going to work with. Uh, since I kind of had a tie, I was going to pick based upon what kind of material I had handy.
Oh, let's see, you're asking if I have the log file for that model and wonder if the lack of convergence uh, may cause a negative PD. Uh, well, in this case, the, it was unable to even construct a DIC. Uh, Winbugs was unable to construct a DIC anyway, so uh, that log file would not would not have a PD value reported in it. So, but I probably do have the log file. Uh, or do I? Maybe not. I don't for the no IV. Yeah, it's there, but again, I'm pretty sure it did not uh, report a DIC. We can double check here. D yeah, it said that it, it the DIC set could not be executed, so I don't think there's going to be anything there. Nope. Yeah, it didn't didn't report one. Okay, makes sense. Uh, let's see, Bill. Can we see the question somewhere? Um. Uh, what questions? Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about the questions people are asking. Yes, I believe the questions should all be visible to you uh, when you in the go to webinar control panel. Uh, you can see there are several little components there. Sometimes they're closed, but if you click on, uh, there's like a little arrow off to the left for each one of these. So you'll have like dashboard, a ten, well, I don't know which ones you have. You probably don't have those, but you should have. Uh, at the very least, you should have something called questions. Uh, so if it's closed, you can open it up. Oh, you don't see the others. Okay. I didn't realize that. Uh, I had assumed that you, they were all visible. Uh, so, sure, I'll be glad to read them loud and clear when, uh, when we get them then. Uh, is there one in particular that you'd like repeated? Actually, that surprises me. I may see if there's a way to set this up different. I was, uh, I had made the assumption that these were visible by everybody. <laughs> yes, as you say, Andreas, wrong model assumption. Took me a while to get your point there, but it sunk in. So. I guess it was, uh, well, I guess another way of looking at that, Andreas, is it was a, uh, I guess it was a hidden model, just like the hidden Markov process. Okay, uh, we've actually gone way over uh, our standard time anyway here, so hopefully that makes up somewhat from the fact that we'll only have this one session this week, uh, and we'll try to make next week worthwhile for you then. Uh, I guess until then, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out and talk to you again next Monday. Bye for now.